Well, this message today, um, maybe more so than uh, other times, is one of those messages where we can't just hear it and say, okay, yeah, I'll chalk that away. This is one of those be doers of the word rather than just hearers of the word. And the, the, the purpose of this message is to help us to walk more successfully as followers of Christ. You know, uh, how to build better relationships. That, that's the, the, the focus. And, and the, the goal, the idea of this is to identify some of the things that, that we do. Maybe we don't even realize we, we have these things going on. And so if we can recognize the, the mess ups that we are doing in our own life, which uh, cause problems in our relationships. And then if we can correct those problems, then we're, we're ahead of the game, so to speak. We're, we're moving in the right direction. We need to understand that we, as followers of Christ, we are, we are called to be together, to be in community together. Uh, we are designed to have relationships and Romans 12, 5 says, There are many people who belong to Christ, and yet we are one body, which is Christ. We are all different, but we depend on each other. If you are a part of the family of God, then you, like it or not, are connected to other believers. You know, you think about a symphony uh, being played it's all of the different instruments together that make it sound so good. If you only had oboes playing, how gross would that be, you know? But if you have all of the different in instruments, then the oboes play an important part and they, they become a vital piece of the music. And, and that's true whether it's drums or trumpets or, you know, whatever. And so we, we need to understand that our strength isn't when we pull away. Our strength is when we are connected with each other. But here's the problem. It is really easy to get disconnected. It is really easy to become broken in our relationships. And it's easy to stay broken. It's easier to stay broken than to put the effort in to correct things. So today, again, what I want to do is look at some different things that we can do, whether knowingly or not, that are, are hard on relationships. And then what can we do to correct those? Now, this, this is, I'm speaking to the church, but this also applies in our personal relationships as husband and wives. This applies in our relationships with people we work with. This has to do with just how we interact with other people. Now, let me give you a little secret. The only person you're ever going to get along with perfectly That's it. I don't even get along with me sometimes, right? And, and you know, only dead people get along with each other. And, and so, uh, again, understand that we need, to, we need to have some tools and some ability to recognize. You know, think about it. Growing up, I was told, you know, I was the youngest of five kids. That explains a lot right there, just being the baby of the family and yada, yada. But uh, understand that, you know, growing up, most of us are just told, you all get along, quit fighting with each other. But we're not really given tools on how to do that. And yet this is probably one of the most critical things in life is how to get along in a healthy way with other people. And we are first and foremost to have a relationship with God, and then we are to have a relationship with others. So let's look at some of the problems, and then what are the antidotes? What are the solutions? The first issue 
I, 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 I hate doing this. This is not preaching, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to myself, and you all just happen to be listening in today. Selfishness. Selfishness destroys relationships. James 4 says, What causes fights and quarrels? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. Every conflict starts with self-centeredness. We all understand that that being selfish, being self-centered is not healthy. So why do we do it? Well, it's who we are. It is our sin nature to be selfish. I think about me, my needs, my interests, my hurts, how I feel. It's part of our ungodly nature to be selfish. It's funny because you'll hear people make statements, and this is something that that I hope you will kind of check away. People will make statements to, well, if there's a loving God, why is there so much evil in the world? Have you ever heard that thrown out at you? Well, I, I have the very quick, quick answer to that. The reason that there, are, there is evil in the world is because you're in the world. And I'm in the world. That's why there's evil in the world. And, and you know, it, when you stop and think about it, the only reason there is good in the world, the only reason that there is happiness in the world is because there is a loving God. Because without a loving God, there would be no love. There would be no kindness. There would be no peace. There would be no caring. There would be no empathy. There would be none of that stuff. It is God who motivates us to do the good that we do. And and if there wasn't a loving God, there would be no good. The fact is, the reason that there is hell is that hell is going to be a place where God's nature is removed. And so what makes hell hell is the fact that there won't be any love, there won't be any hope, there won't be any happiness, there won't be any joy. You know, these these yahoos that say, when I get to hell, I'm going to party with my friends. No, you're not. You're going to be totally isolated and alone, and you are going to be stuck with yourself for eternity. Now, Proverbs 28, 25 says, selfishness only causes trouble. So if selfishness is what causes trouble, what is the cure? What is the antidote? Selflessness. That's what builds relationships. Selflessness is when we can look beyond ourselves. Galatians 6, 7 and 8 says, The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others and ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. All he'll have to show for his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's Spirit do the growth work in him, harvest a crop of real life and eternal life. This verse is really important, and I hope you'll maybe mark it and come back and spend some time on your own just studying on it. Because what we see here is the principle of sowing and reaping. And and the whole universe is built on, on this principle, on this concept. What you sow, you're going to reap. If you have a critical spirit... If you, um, you know, then what's going to happen is people are going to become critical of you. If you plant affirmation and love and joy, people are going to respond back to you with what you have sowed. Whatever you sow in life, that's what you're going to reap back. And, And this is an important verse because it also gives us several other things. It says that we are to respond to God when, when something goes sideways in our life, 
rather than to what others do. So when you inevitably have someone be critical or be angry towards you or, or, or something like that, rather than responding to, to, to them in anger or, or reprisal, instead come to God and pour your heart out to God. This is, this is so important for us to understand because all we do is make the problem compounded when we fire back at somebody else who has been wrong to us. Now, God rewards selfless behavior. God wants us to become more like Him. That's the message that we need to understand, that everything we have in this life is a gift from God. God has given us all the good that we have. And so He gave it to us not because we've earned it or deserve it. He gave it to us because He is an unselfish God. And so we are to become more and more like Him. You know, if you don't get anything else I have to say, if you're about to doze off, then here is the one thing that you, you should store away. The number one lesson in life is that we must learn to be like Jesus. Make that your life goal, that you are going to pursue becoming more like Jesus. And one of the things that Jesus is, is unselfish. What does the Bible tell us? Love God, love others, right? That, that's, that's what it means to be unselfish. Notice also there in the Galatians that it, in Galatians it says that letting God's Spirit do the growth work in you. Understand that this is a process. You don't just wake up one morning and you've arrived. We live in an a agricultural community. We understand a farmer plants the seed. And then over time, that seed germinates and it grows and it develops and it, it grows to a point that it begins to produce fruit. That's what we should understand in our lives, that as you walk with Christ, as you become more and more submitted to Christ, as you recognize areas of your life like selfishness and you begin to submit to Christ, then you're going to grow in that relationship and in that understanding and wisdom. And you're going to become more and more unselfish. You're going to become more like Christ. <coughs> now, we are compulsively selfish. It, it is part of who we are. And the only way we're going to break this cycle of selfishness is as we submit to Christ and God's Spirit gains more control in our lives. Choose to follow Christ and you will become more unselfish. Now, a second area that, that leads to, to problems is the area of pride. Now, pride is a relationship killer. Proverbs 13.10 says, Pride leads to arguments. Now, pride can show up in a lot of different ways. I'm going to list off some things, and I, I, I have some instructions for you. No pointing fingers, all right? No pointing. That is not allowed. We're in church, okay? All I want us to do is look at ourselves and examine our own, our own attitudes. Pride shows up as criticism of others, of being judgmental, of looking down at other people in, in, in a, a critical way, which that's the only way you can look down on someone. If you're always looking at everybody else and, and kind of comparing, well, it, I, I'm doing better than them, or why or are they doing that? You know, those sort of things. Having to, to feel like you've got to be better than other people. The, these are pride issues. If you... I'm sorry about this one. 
If you have a stubborn streak, that is not an attribute, okay? That is a sign of sinfulness in our lives, to be stubborn. It, it, you know, it, it, if you find it difficult to apologize, for those of you that remember the TV show Happy Days and the Fonz, if you're young, you'll go, huh, what are you talking about? <laughs> but I remember an episode where Fonzie was wrong on something and he had to apologize. And he kept going, I, I was wrong. I, I, oh. He couldn't bring himself to say that I was wrong. You know, that, that's a pride issue if you can't apologize when you're wrong. This is, this is an issue of pride. If, if you have shallow relationships, if you keep everything so superficial so that nobody gets to know you very well, if you fake it, if you're sitting here right now and you're, you're faking it, you're wearing a mask, you've got your church mask on right now, that's a pride issue. It, 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 it's a, a realization that you don't want anyone to know who you really are. When you're so shallow that you really don't care about anybody else, you, you, all you care about is yourself, this is, this is a pride issue. And pride has no place in the Christian's life. And, and, and again, I, I've already told you, I'm speaking to myself this morning. You just happen to be listening in. Okay? I, I, I am not aiming this at anybody but myself. But we need to understand that when we allow these issues to take hold in our lives, it ruins relationships. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride will destroy a person. A proud attitude leads to ruin. The message, which is a paraphrase, reads this verse this way. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. Pride destroys relationships. We need to understand that. In our society, somehow we have made pride something that we should be, that we should be proud of. But pride is not something that, that we should hold up. What does the Bible say we should have? Humility. Humility is the, the absence of pride. Humility is what builds relationships. 1 Peter 3.8 says, Live in harmony, be sympathetic, love each other, have compassion, be humble. Those are five attributes. And, and I told the folks in the first service, if you don't have a verse that kind of guides your life, may I recommend this one? Because here we have five behaviors, five attributes that, that should define us as, as we live. And all of these attributes really are built on the last one, be humble. The ability to be humble is a good model of life. And not false humility, but, but true humility. We are to live in harmony with each other. And, and that's what God is wanting in our relationships. Well, how do we have humility? Well, a lot of times the way humility comes is through getting the cred beat out of us in life. Just to be quite honest, if you look at the life of Job or you look at the life of Joseph... In, in the Old Testament, both of those guys came to humility through the school of hard knocks. And, and that, that is a very real, viable way. But again, the best way for us to become humble is to live like Jesus. Ephesians 4, 23 and 24 says, Let the Spirit change your way of thinking and make you into a new person. Well, how do you become a new person? By becoming more and more like Christ. He was humble. You know, he, Jesus wants to spend time with you. 
He, he desires that connection with you. That's why Jesus died on the cross so that you would have the opportunity to know God and to have a relationship with Him. And if you want to look at what humility looks like, look at poor Jesus, what He went through. In Philippians 2, it says, Be humble and give more honor to others than yourself. Your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. Just think about Jesus. He's in the heavenlies. And he gave all of that up to come to earth as the lowest of, of humanity. He, he came as a servant. He came in a lowly position. He didn't come as a king or in, in some high and mighty place. He came in a, a lowly position. He lived his life in a lowly way. He didn't, you know, he, again, he didn't go out and, and say, you have to do all it. He just said, this is the way you're to live. And he was hated for it, and he was crucified for it. That's humility. You know, nobody has ever done anything more humble than Jesus. And so when we begin to spend time with Jesus, he's going to rub off on us. And we will begin to become more like him, humble. And that's what builds the relationships. Now, there's a third relationship killer, and when I say it, you're going to kind of go, I, I don't really catch this, but it's insecurity. When insecurity ruins relationships. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of human opinion disables. When I am so insecure that I am more worried about what other people think of me than anything else, then that ruins my ability to have a relationship. Insecurity ultimately comes out in the form of us trying to control other people. You think about a bully, and you look at a bully, and it's like they're, they're pushing other people around, and they're intimidating other people, and they're being aggressive toward other people. But what they're really saying on the inside is, I'm scared to death. And the only way I know how to control the situation is to intimidate and control you. And that's, that is, again, part of our old sin nature. It has no part in a Christian's life. It, it, it has to be driven out of our lives. And the reason that insecurity is a relationship ruiner is because it, it causes us to fear being revealed, being exposed for who we are. Think about Adam. After he and Eve sinned by eating the forbidden fruit, the very first words out of the, his mouth that are recorded in the Bible, God is walking through the, the garden and he's calling out, Adam, where are you? And Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. He was afraid because he had been exposed for who he was. And that's what insecurity does. We hide ourselves. We, we cover up. We wear masks. We pretend to be something that we are not. All you have to do is look on Facebook, right? You know, everybody's something that they're not on Facebook. Uh, you know, fear makes us be dishonest and it causes us to build up facades, to build up these, these, these fake walls where we present ourselves as something that we're not. And as a result, what happens is no one really ever gets to know the real you. And, and that's, that's against God's plan. We're part of the body of Christ here. We should know each other. We should care about each other, warts and all. 
And so when, you know, again, God's design is that we're not all supposed to be exactly alike. It's our differences that make us strong. We're woven together to become the fabric that form the, the church. You know, and, and we, we fear rejection. You know, we, we think, well, if people really knew what I was like, they wouldn't like me. Well, that may be very true. But as you become more like Christ, you will become a, a more likable person. And, and I know that we all are, hate being rejected. There's probably not a person here who has never gone through the, the hardship of rejection. And, and it's real easy after you've been hurt to say, never again, I'm, I'm never going to let anyone get close to me because I don't want to be hurt like that again. And so we build these walls. But the problem is when we build those walls, we rob ourselves, we rob others, and we quench the Holy Spirit. And that is not godly living. So again, if you want to look at Jesus he understands being rejected. He was crucified by his very creation. That's rejection. And so, again, if you want understanding, if you want someone who's going to relate to you in a, in a good way, seek Jesus, draw close to Jesus. You can be honest with him. And as he gives you confidence then you can begin to, to be more open about who you are. The antidote to, to this is love. Love is what it overcomes insecurity. The Bible says in 1 John 4, love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid... It shows that his love has not been perfected in us. Well, how does love work? It expels fear. When we understand who we are in Jesus, and we understand how loved we are in Jesus, then we no longer have to worry about whether somebody over here or someone over here or someone over there doesn't like us. Because... I am secure that the God of the universe loves me. That's how this works. And it takes the focus off of self and it helps us put it on to other people. You know, when, when we begin to look around and say, rather than me focus on me all the time, I'm going to begin to love others and because that's what Christ does and that's what Christ would have me do, then all of a sudden, instead of being all introspective, I become outward perspective. You know, genuine love is caring about other people. And this is the way a, a healthy relationship works. When I counsel with couples that are going through struggles or, or considering getting married or, or things like that. This is one of the things I always want them to understand. Genuine love is looking to the need of the other person. And so instead of saying, what's in this for me? Come to every relationship with how can I minister to that other person? How can I love that other person? What is in their best interest? And if both parties are doing that, then both parties are going to have their needs met. But soon as one person says, I'm in it for me, I don't care about you, I'm only caring about myself, that's when problems arise. And if both people are doing that, well then there's absolutely no hope whatsoever. And so understand, true relationship means I am in it for you and you're in it for me and we will support each other mutually. That's what real love looks like. How do we find the, 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 the ability to do that? Christ in us. That's the only way. When we give 
and we understand that God is loving us, then that gives us the ability to continue to love. When we understand that our identity, our self-worth, are not found in what someone else thinks about me or says about me, but it's found in what Christ has done for me, then we are set free to, to live the kind of life that we're supposed to. Again, 1 John 4 says, All who proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in Him. God is love. And as we live in God, our love grows more and more perfect. So we will not be afraid. Now, if you have never committed your life to Christ, then that is the first step. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you've committed your life to Christ, but you've kind of drifted away. You've, you've lost your focus. Make today the day that you say, I'm getting back on where I'm supposed to be. I am recommitting my life. Now, the last issue that we're going to look at very briefly is the issue of resentment. Resentment destroys relationships. Job 5.2 says, To worry yourself to death with resentment is foolish, since it's a senseless thing to do. Let's be honest. Every single one of us have messed up in life. And it is just, again, part of the fact that we are sinners. We have a sin nature. I don't measure up to God, and most of the time I don't even measure up to my own standards. You know, and maybe that's true for you. Because we are all imperfect, we inevitably hurt other people, and other people hurt us. Whether it's intentionally or unintentionally, this is a reality. And it is very easy to get angry when these things happen. But it is always wrong to become resentful. Again, there is a right kind of anger. When, when we look around the world and we see the injustice that goes on in this world, it should make us angry. When we see the, the filth and the evil that is going on in this world, it should make us angry. Righteously so. But that doesn't mean that we become resentful, that we become bitter, because bitter, bitterness, resentfulness, it's like an acid. And if it gets on you, and you don't get it cleaned off, it's going to burn you, and it's going to scar you for the rest of your life. And so it is critical that we understand how wrong bitterness, resentfulness is in our lives. When something resentful splashes you know, onto us, the goal is to get it cleaned off. Uh, and and some, some weird things happen when we allow bitterness to, to rise up. Uh, in Psalm 73, it says, Since my heart was embittered and my soul deeply wounded, I was stupid and could not understand. I love that. I, I, I mean, that, um, I am here to attest I have been stupid a lot of times. I, you know, and, and as a result, I responded in stupid ways. Now, what happens is you begin to react and you begin to think in ways that are not productive or helpful. And then the verse goes on, it says, Watch out that no bitterness takes root among you, for as it springs up, it causes deep trouble hurting many in their spiritual lives. Here's what needs to happen. Again, we are in community together. So when someone is struggling so that they don't become bitter, so that they don't become resentful, we are to come along beside them. You know, the problem with Christians is too often when someone's struggling, we treat them like they have leprosy. And we go, whoa, 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 I don't want any part of this. I don't want to get involved. But just the opposite needs to happen. We need to come alongside that person who's going through the hardship and love them and carry them through and support them so that they don't become bitter, so that they don't become resentful. This is how we grow. This is how we develop. 
And, and the sad reality is, is a lot of times the people that we should love the most, people like family, our parents, our children, our, our brothers and sisters, those are the people we end up resenting. What's the antidote? Forgiveness. Forgiveness builds relationship. The ability to let somebody off the hook. You know, here's, here's the reality. Colossians 3.13. You must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Understand, resentment is, again, it's like an acid. And the way you wash it off is by forgiving the person, whether they deserve it or not. Because you're not doing it as much for them as you are for yourself. Resent, you know, when, when you're resentful, it's just going to eat you up. It's going to make you mis miserable. And, and here's the point. God, if you are a follower of Christ, you have accepted forgiveness from God. So you better darn well forgive other people. Because... Here's the sowing and reaping issue again. As you have forgiven, you will be forgiven. Isn't that exactly what we pray in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Isn't that exactly what we're saying? Now, you may be sitting here and you may be saying, I cannot forgive that person. They hurt me so bad. I want to forgive them, but I can't do it. This is why you need Jesus Christ. The more you invest in Christ, the more you walk with Christ, the more Christ will give you the strength, the ability, the grace to forgive. It is a growth process. You may not be there right now, but you must be willing to walk the walk. And as you submit to Christ, Christ will come over you and He will equip you with the ability to forgive. Forgiving is letting go of the pain and letting go of the, the hurt that that person inflicted. And it may be you need to forgive yourself because the same rule applies. Just as Christ forgave you, maybe you need to forgive yourself. If you hold on to it as a grudge, as a resentment, you're only going to continue to become more and more broken. God says, let it go. Now, this is, this is some very basic stuff. And as I said at the very start of the message, this is being doers of the word. You can't hear this message and say, okay, and walk out the door. You're going to have to apply what I've, I've tried to show you this morning. We all are in relationship. Probably there's a good number of us that have broken relationships. Today's the day to begin to heal those. And it starts with each one of us. Let's pray. Father, we so desperately need you. Uh, you are the answer to every struggle, every problem, every hardship, every hurt that we have. And my prayer is that you will help each of us to want you in a healthy relationship with you more than anything else. And I pray, Lord, that through that desire, it will lead us to healthy relationships with each other. Help us to get over the struggles, the hurts, the, the hang-ups, the problems that we have, and instead allow you to bring true healing into our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.